Sorry, I'm not going to use the podium because I can hardly see over it. So, I'll just... so thank you very much for the invitation. I had a horrible, a horrible feeling for five seconds I was going to have to give this in French, which, <laughs> which would have been really quick. <laughs> um, and it's wonderful to come to a proper winter rather than a kind of wet, mild, cold English winter. So, and it's my first time to Montreal, so thanks ever so much for the invite. Okay, so I've entitled my presentations Vaccine for Hepatitis C Virus, and I mean a prophylactic vaccine by that. Where there's a will, there's a way. And I strongly believe that that's true. If we put enough effort in, we will have a vaccine for Hepatitis C. Okay, so um, just to introduce the area, um, Hepatitis C virus is not going away anytime soon. Um, the WHO data in 2017 showed there's still a global prevalence of approximately 75 million RNA positive people. And the impact of DAAs, despite intensive rollout over the last four years, has had a minimal impact on the global prevalence, if you, if you look where most of these infections actually are. And we still have approximately 1.5 million new infections every year, um, which is... Um, more than patients receiving DAAs annually globally. And as everybody here knows, I think there's an ongoing epidemic of acute HCV infection, particularly in the USA, in opioid drug users, and in men who have sex with men all over the world. Um, I would argue that genetic diversity remains the major challenge to a hep C vaccine, and that's a point I'm going to come back to later. Um, so I don't want to belittle the new drugs for hepatitis C is clearly a fantastic, amazing achievement. But all is not perfect. They're still expensive to many developing world you know, countries, uh, which also don't have the infrastructure to kind of deliver drugs for many weeks. And you still need eight to 12 weeks of these drugs. Um, many people transmit hepatitis C infection to the next person before they've had the opportunity to be treated in the first couple of years after infection. And of course, these drugs do not um, protect against reinfection. Um, there was easel data last year, which showed that in intravenous drug users, the 18-month reinfection rate after an SVR was as high as 17.1 per 100 persons year. So that's really high. And I think the main point, really, that I, I want to make is this. Most people are unaware they're infected in the first place, and so they can present an, at, at an advanced stage when they already have HCC, liver cirrhosis, and liver hepatocellular cancer. And, and I would argue that prevention is just infinitely better than you know, cure, and a vaccine, you know, frankly, is just better medicine. Um, it is the best medicine. There's no doubt about that. Um, and the other issue is we've, we've, already, we've already given drugs to those populations that are easy to get drugs out to, and we're left with these kind of residual patient populations, prisons, injecting drug users, developing world countries, that are really hard. We've kind of taken the low-hanging fruit, and our job is only going to get harder in the next five to 10 years in terms of global eradication. Right, so I think I've made a really good case for a vaccine for hepatitis C. Um, so, if you all agree that vaccines are better medicine, why don't we have one? And one of the major reasons, I think, still, is that we haven't tried hard enough to make one. And here's the evidence for that. So, this was a hepatitis C drug therapy pipeline, which was and has been incredibly lucrative for lots of people um, in 2013 to 2014. There's about 50 new compounds here coming through, through phase one phase two, phase three, and phase four studies, you know, polymerase, protease, and NS5A inhibitors. And these have now boiled down to a, to a relative, you know, relatively small number of highly effective drugs. Though I have to say, viral resistance is still an issue, okay? It hasn't, it, it hasn't you know, gone away, and it's quite possible that five to 10 years from now, when we see some of these resistance strains getting into the population, this could also be an issue. But anyway, that's, that's the effort that we made in terms of drugs. Now, contrast this with the efforts that we've made for a hep C vaccine, and I plotted that out in the, in the, same, in the same format in the next slide, and it looks like that. And the one vaccine, the ADMVA vaccine, is the one that I've been working on for the last 
six years, and the E1, E2 protein vaccine is the one that John is going to talk about after me. So you can see why we don't have a hep C vaccine. No one is kind of funding this, and that ought to change. Right, is it possible to make a hepatitis C virus vaccine? Natural history studies tell us definitely it should be, and we know this because of those people that get acutely infected, unlike HIV, where everybody gets persistent infection, 20% of people spontaneously resolve infection and their immune system is able to eradicate the virus in those people. It should be possible to recapitulate that natural history event and to make a vaccine that enables spontaneous resolution. And, you know, my lab and others have spent many years comparing the immunity between those individuals that get persistent infection to those people who resolve infection. There's been fantastic genome-wide association studies that have highlighted the role of interferon lambda-4, the innate immune system, and class 2 alleles, which implicates your CD4 T-cell response, also falls out from those genome-wide association studies. B-cell immunity probably plays a role, but it's not absolutely required because we know that patients with A-gamma globulinemia who can't make antibodies can spontaneously clear hepatitis C. So I think there's definitely a role for B-cell and antibody induction, but it's not necessarily necessary. And then there's lots of evidence that your T-cell immune response plays a critical role in HCV spontaneous resolution. I, I don't think we fully understand the reasons for immune, immune failure still in chronic hepatitis C, and there's plenty of basic research still to be done in this area. Okay, so how to make a hepatitis C vaccine? Broadly, I think you can break it down into two camps. The camps that I'm going to talk about, really, how to, how to make a T-cell vaccine, and then John's going to talk about vaccines that induce antibodies. But ultimately, we, we, we probably should be trying to find approaches that bring these two arms of the immune system together to, to give vaccines the very best chance. So vaccines that aim to induce antibodies include E1, E2 protein, vaccine. So E1, E2 is the envelope around hepatitis C. The real issue with this is the hypervariable regions of the envelope, which are the, which are the, which are the natural target for antibodies. And a bit like influenza allows hep, hep C to relatively readily escape from the antibody response. I've got a program at the moment with Heidi in um, Australia, and she has an E2 protein construct with the hypervariable de delta regions kind of deleted from that, and we're trying to combine that with our T-cell vaccine. People are trying virus-like particles. A rational strategy is to just kill and boil the virus up and give it to people. The, the, the issue with that is it's hard to grow it in the lab, and you can only grow hep C in cancer cell lines. And obviously, that, you know, that's got all kinds of implications for taking a virus that you've grown in cancer cell lines and giving that to people. Um, and then there's other other very good groups now working on inducing specific envelope antibodies. So those are the broad approaches. Vaccines that aim to induce T cells can include peptide vaccines, epitope strings, and our approach at Oxford University has, has been to use viral vectors to, to deliver large immunogens to H, HLA class one and class two molecules. And the advantage of this approach really is that you can put very large immunogens into this. You don't have to take a patient's HLA type into account because all of the antigen is in there and, and, and they're very safe. Okay, so for this, I think it will come eventually. It's probably just a busy slide. Okay, so the, the, the rationale for a T-cell vaccine is this. There are HLA association studies where if you're HLA A3, B57, or B27, you're more likely to spontaneously clear hep C. Chimpanzee CD4 and CD8 T-cell blocking experiments, which were led by Nagler actually a very long time ago now, which showed that if you blocked the CD4 and the CD8 T-cell compartment, these chimpanzees became chronically infected. The association of the breadth and the magnitude of the T-cell response with viral eradication. The fact that your T-cell response is temporarily correlated with reduced viremia after infection. And some of the very nice data came from um, the Okairos group, who had a prophylactic vaccine, which they applied to 
chimpanzees using adeno viral vectors, and then they infected them with a heterologous strain of hepatitis C. And I can just highlight that one data slide here. So this was, this was published in kind of Nature Medicine a very long time ago now. And on the left, you've got the adenoviral vaccinated animals. And on the right, you've got the mock vaccinated animals. And you can see the vaccinated animals have this little blip of HCV, no rise in the ALT pretty much, and four out of five spontaneously eradicated Hep C, unlike the muck vaccinated animals. So this was really proof of principle for the first time that a T cell vaccine could prevent hepatitis C in chimpanzees. And natural history studies from Andrew Cox's group have also suggested this is possible. So here you can see one individual, subject 133, that gets infected with the genotype 1A strain. They have this really strong immune response. And then when they get reinfected, you get eradication again, um, with a much, much more rapid timeline. So, you know, once again, natural history studies tell us that, that, that um, you know, a vaccine for hepatitis C should be possible. So at Oxford, we've been using chimpanzee adenoviral vectors. And we use these because all of us are exposed to adenoviral vectors, and you have pre-existing immunity to these, which can limit the effect of adenoviral vector vaccines, whereas you almost certainly haven't been exposed to chimpanzee adenoviral vectors, and there's lack of cross-reactivity between these. Um, this is what a phylogenetic tree looks like. So they're quite closely related, chimpanzee and human adenoviral vectors, but, but they are distinct. And to start off with, we picked ADCHIMP3 and ADHU6. So ADHU6 is a rare human adenoviral vectors. We made a hep C vaccine using these two different ad adenoviral vectors encoding all the non-structural proteins from a genotype 1B strain of hepatitis C. And we put them in these two adenoviral vectors and vaccinated macaques. And what you can see is you get this really nice response to the priming vaccination and a larger response still with a heterologous boost vaccination. And um, these are really magnificent responses. For those, those of you who, are, who kind of looked at Ellie spots in patients with acute and chronic hepatitis C, your normal response is a kind of 25 spots in chronic hep C and you know, maybe 500, 1,000 in acute hep C. So these were fantastic results and we were really excited and thought, right, this is a strategy. We can take this on now to Oxford students, which is, which is what we did. And the first thing we were able to show actually is that human human Oxford students are not actually macaques. It was a real shock, this data, um, because we, we did get a really nice response to the priming vaccine, like the macaques, but when we came in with a heterologous boosting vaccine, and it didn't matter which way round you kind of gave those two vaccines, we saw a really blunted, attenuated response. The numbers are relatively small. It's probably just that the students are older than macaques, relatively. There's still some pre-existing antibodies there to adenoviral vectors. There probably was some cross-reactivity. And antibodies to the first adenoviral vectors inhibits your response to the second one. And everyone was really distraught when this data came out because we thought, right, it's failed. Um, but, at the but, at but at the same time, we were kind of watching the malaria program coming through Oxford that we're using a modified vaccinia anchorer vector as their boost. So we very quickly replaced the second adeno with a modified vaccinia anchor. And um, now you can see we get a really nice response, rather like we had in the macaques. Um, this, this data slide here summarizes three years' work. It was quite a long time to kind of get to this point, but, but that's where we got to. Um, and we've done extensive work and phenotyping using intracellular cytokine staining, CYTOF, HLA class one and class two pentamers, transcriptomas analysis to show that these looked like highly functional T cells, the kind of T cells you would want to see in a vaccine, expressing high levels of perforin and granzyme and cytolytic markers and so on, with really strong proliferative capacity, uh, especially after ad MVA that increased over time. So we were pretty optimistic um, um, about this vaccine. Um, it went on to be assessed uh, in Baltimore and San Francisco, Kim Page and Andrea Cox, 540 injecting drug users. Most of you here will know the results. They were presented and they have still only been presented in abstract form last year. 
Um, the results really couldn't have been worse. And um, they're, they're kind of highlighted here in a single sentence uh, halfway down. Um, investigators report that 14 of the 275 participants in the experimental vaccine group and 14 of the 270 three participants in the placebo group became chronically infected with hepatitis C. So the efficacy for preventing chronic infection for this really potent T cell vaccine was naught. Now, there's a huge amount of analysis to be done on this. Um, there are hints, I understand, that the vaccine did do something but didn't clearly prevent chronic infection. This will be a big publication when it comes out, which it will do later on this year. But there were plenty, there were actually plenty of hints from some of our earlier data that this vaccine could potentially run into problems. And this is really that data. It's the cross-reactivity data um, where, where um, there's, a, there's a major issue of hep C targeting multiple HCV genotypes here. So these are the these are the cross-reactivity assays. And you can see that if you, if, if, if you take these T cells from people vaccinated with a genotype 1B vaccine, they make a strong response, but much less cross-reactivity if you go on to genotype 1A, 3A, or 4A. There was also a hint, because we gave these vaccines to chronically infected patients also, and some of those patients made a really strong response to the vaccine, and most of them made no response at all. And the reason why some people made a response to the vaccine be was because there was, there was discordance between the immunogen and the virus in those patients. Again, indicating that where you had matching of the antigen with your immunogen, you saw impaired T cell responses. Um, and this is, this is actually really nicely highlighted with this one epitope. It's a KLSG epitope. This is a single T cell epitope. It's very very prominent in HL, HLA A2 people with this vaccine. And it shows no cross-reactivity with the other common circulating variants in the population. So we were, I was very concerned when this data came out that there was potentially going to be an issue here. And not surprisingly, therefore, when you give these vaccines to people with chronic infection, they have no effect at all on viral load. We have therefore proceeded to make a conserved segment hepatitis C vaccine where you take all the major genotypes one to six, you identify the genetic components that are identical between them all, you line them up, and we've made a new adenoviral vector construct containing the genetically conserved segments. And this, 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 this has shown very nice cross-reactivity in mice studies, and we would like to find funding now to take this through to human studies. So in the last five minutes, I want to just introduce some work looking at um, invariant chain as a genetic adjuvant, because this is quite exciting, and it's a genetic adjuvant that could be applied to lots of vaccines, not just hepatitis C. So class two invariant chain is a type two transmembrane glycoprotein that's, that's, that's intimately linked to HLA class two antigen presentation. And the idea was you could take this genetic adjuvant attach it to your immunogen, and in that way, pull that through the HLA class two pathway and enhance your CD4 T cell responses. People have been trying this since 1998 in a range of different vectors, and we're able to show that actually not only is your CD4 response, but your CD8 response is also enhanced using this kind of construct. So we have very recently performed the first assessment of this, first in healthy people and then in DAA-treated people. We've excluded patients who are HLA B57 and those with a family history of autoimmune disease. And we were forced to do that because just as this work started, funded by the EU, huge program of work, this report came out which showed autoantibodies against invariant chain are present in patients with spondyloarthritis. It put a whole halt on the program. We had to do new tox studies in you know, macaques, but we got through all of that and we vaccinated people now for the first time. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to go on to the immunology data and show that with this invariant chain construct here, you can three times fold increase the magnitude of your T cell response. And you see that there in the right hand plot. Um, whether more is going to be better in preventing hepatitis C, you've still got this issue of genetic diversity. I think, I think it's not going to be enough, but we can definitely do better still in terms of T cell magnitude, and you get, you know, absolutely enormous CD4 and CD8 T cell responses with, 
with this new genetic adjuvant. Um, you can map the relevant region down to only 25 amino acids from class two invariant chains. So the whole thing is 274 amino acids, but it maps down to only 25 that really matter. And you find those not just in humans, but in all animal species. So in our latest vaccine construct, we've actually taken shark minimal fragment invariant chain, and we're using that as our genetic adjuvant. We've attached that to the um, conserved segment T cell vaccine and shown we can get a threefold increase in the T cell response. So this is a promising new vaccine candidate that I now think should be moved on to human studies. Um, lastly, I just think we should be thinking about this. You, you, you want these T cells in the you know, liver, and there's nice work coming out now to show you may be able to pull T cells into the liver by giving these viral vectors intravenously. The idea here is you give the first vaccination intramuscularly so that you induce functional T cells in the periphery, and then you give an IV injection, and these viral vectors, as you can see from the plot here, pour into the liver, and they hang around in the liver for a very long time and express antigen there. And in that way, you draw T cells into the liver compartment. And we should be thinking actually about new ways to enhance T cell immunity in the liver, which is where all the action happens. So um, I'd like to end there. I'd, I'd, I, I'd like to say that ADMVA is an excellent platform for safely inducing high magnitude T cells, but magnitude alone is clearly not enough to make a preventative hepatitis C vaccine. Animal models are powerful, but humans are not animals, and we've been repeatedly surprised at the results. We need more animal models, but, 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 but they have to be managed. Um, viral variability remains a major issue for HCV vaccination. Class two invariant chain is a genetic adjuvant that's, that can powerfully further enhance your T cell responses. Even potent T cell vaccines cannot, cannot overcome T cell exhaustion when you vaccinate chronic people. This has got major implications for those who are working in the area of chronic HPV immunotherapy, like I am also. A T cell vaccine is probably not enough. You'll need something else like a checkpoint blocker or something like that. Um, and we urgently now need new platforms for vaccine testing, whether those are animal models or human challenge experiments, which I've been you know, banging on about now for the last five years, is that actually it, it took six years and $20 million to test that first vaccine candidate. It, if we've got 20 fantastic vaccine candidates, it's actually really kind of difficult to see how you can move those on rapidly without doing something innovative now, much more innovative than we currently have. But that could be something for discussion, and I'll stop there. So thank you very much.